for the day today, and they've written for Week Ending, Spitting Image, much else. Stuart Lee believes that comedy, like any art, should challenge the way people think, and he worries at the idea that if you aren't careful, and perhaps even if you are, alternative comedy becomes the orthodoxy against which it was a rebellion. Stuart, your choice. I chose Knowledge of Angels by uh, Jill Patton Walsh. This is, um, it's a great book. It's set in uh, 1500s on a nondescript uh, Mediterranean Catholic island. It's about two stories that run parallel and then sort of fit together. Uh, a girl who's found having been raised by wolves and is taken into care by some nuns. And a man who's washed up on the shore who says he's from a country where you're now allowed not to believe in God if you want. And then he's put in prison and tried as an atheist. And the uh, monks have to... Uh, train the wolf girl to speak and see if she can recognize God and that proves God exists and therefore the man's not allowed to be an atheist and has to be put to death so it's sort of a suspense thriller with fantastic theological overtones but I really enjoyed it and it's uh, good to bring it along so I think it's quite relevant to a lot of things today as well where people discuss sort of religious aspects to the news and I don't think we've, society's really changed that much in 500 years. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's a book about the struggle of ideas, isn't it? Mm. And, and, and the struggle of ideas becomes a, a kind of tremendous narrative excitement, I think. More winner. Yes, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I had a bit of a problem getting into the book, and I, I think partly because of this sort of um, parallel universe sort of thing. I mean, I thought, you know, when I first opened it, and, I, and I'll just read this little bit, it says, It is set on an island somewhat like Mallorca, but not Mallorca, at a time somewhat like 1450, but not 1450. A fiction is always, however obliquely, about the time and place in which it was written. I almost couldn't turn the page. I thought mm. that was an incredibly pretentious opening and sort of unnecessary. It gets better. Yeah, it, well, it, it did, thank <laughs> Very goodness. Much better. And, I, and, I, and I did have a problem with this idea, why don't you just say it is at this time, and this is, this is an argument, and I would have been happier not having this kind of mm. imaginary wrapping paper. Mm. Um, but I, I really enjoyed that, the whole kind of religious debate of it. I mean, it, it kept reminding me of something, and I... And, 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 and it reminded me, I think, is it the writings of, is it Thomas Aquinas or yeah, yeah John of the Cross? Mm. It seemed like those kind of arguments, mm. the sort of thing. In that respect also, there was something a bit adolescent about it, I thought, about, I mean, I, I remember being very, very absorbed in that, those kind of details when I was, when I was in my teens yeah. in those kind of religious arguments and wanting to understand more about them. And in that respect, it was really good to flex your muscles yeah. again. But it, it, it wasn't revelatory in that respect. Well, I, I, yes, I, I mean, the, the argument really is about whether there is evil, whether the love of God exists naturally or mm -hmm. not. And I suppose uh, uh, adolescents may be interested in it, but I suppose it remains a permanent uh, question, doesn't it? Of interest, whether in fact people are born uh, with the tendency to virtue or a tendency to vice. Absolutely, I think it was the specific nature of the dialectic that made me. Yeah. That made well, me. I know what you're somewhere. saying about the conversations. I mean, a large part of the book is um, they basically imprison the the atheist who's called. Uh, Palinor in a beautiful house with lovely gardens and the monks who are sort of trying him really get to the point where they enjoy visiting him because they look forward to being argued with and it sort of reminds me of the kind of conversations you always end up having drunk in the pub at 11 o'clock <laughs> yeah, exactly. but, but instead exactly. they're done they're written really beautifully yeah. and done yes. uh, done with a sort of dramatic flow and also I think it's the first thing I've ever come across that's like about atheism but is but is beautiful and poetic mm. rather than dry I'll put my cards on the table I'm an atheist myself but most of the sort of literature that you can look to for support is kind of dreary 19th century pamphlets written by men with beards. Whereas here, <laughs> here you've got a novel that's quite helpful in discussing a lot of those issues, but is written in a beautiful way, and it's, and it's loving rather than... There's a lot of love in it rather than it just being sort of academic and full of kind of bitterness, like a lot of atheist kind of tracks are. And, um, and also it's very, really sympathetic to the Christians in it. Essentially, they're the villains. Their views end up with a man being killed, but it's still... You still feel for them and the, thought, the thoughts they're going through, and they're, they're much more fully realised characters. In fact, a lot of the monks in it than the um, than Palinor is, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, because you do, you do sympathise with them because they change. I mean, he really, he really rattles them because he is yeah. an incredibly sympathetic character. He's he's the most moral of them all, and well, and it kind of absolutely turns their worlds upside down when they have to confront their world crumbling, basically, their belief. And yeah. what's brought out beautifully is, is that, in fact, uh, well, for example, Severo, who is the sort of uh, theological master of the island, uh, mm. he, he is he is absolutely in a state of delight when he discovers for the first time he can meet and uh, intellectually juggle with an atheist. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, here lies part of the tragedy. We shouldn't say too much about that, but his, his delight in keeping him there and talking to him in the end uh, has a tragic ending, which, which is tragic for everybody concerned. There was something about it I felt was was inconclusive about mm. all of the strands of it. Mm. And I think to a certain extent that, that sort of bothered me. I felt that the, 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 particularly the wolf girl, particularly Amara, 
I felt like I wanted more from her. Maybe that was a good thing. I wanted, I wanted more from her growth. I wanted to know who she was, yeah. not just what she said. W when I read a book like 1984 or Lady Chatter's Lover, I, I always think, well, this is good, but the, the argument is so subservient to the characters that in a way you get frustrated because mm. they, they behave in a way that isn't realistic just to, mm. just to make yeah. points. And there's elements of that in this book. And, I mean, Palinor, for example, is so perfect in every way, the atheist, he's such a reasonable, likeable man. There's even a bit at the beginning where he's, disguised, he's described as being particularly well endowed, and the women that rescue him out of the yeah. sea find him, and their husbands, it said, will suffer by comparison with him forever. So yeah. even if it's not <laughs> enough that Jill Patton Walsh has described this man who's beautiful, <laughs> intelligent, handsome, and considerate, he's also, you know, got fantastic genitalia. It's well it's like, hung, yeah. you know, <laughs> this is true of all atheists. Though. True. Well, like, <laughs> obviously, that is true. Yeah, I, I agree with that. There is a lovely scene in which Palinor makes love with almost everybody in a room. Well, and, you, you, uh, more when I come. I was going to say I wanted, I wanted to ask what you both thought about that because I was wondering whether that was supposed to be the fatal flaw. Yeah, well, I couldn't decide. You see, first or time I read it, I perfection. thought that's interesting because he's, um, he, he basically he, uh, he ends up sleeping with both his male and female servants simultaneously, yeah. and I couldn't work out if that was the author saying, well, the the logical extension of being an atheist is maybe that you that you don't have a moral system, and so he's allowed to do that, but I don't think it is that. I think that. The image at the end of that scene, it's, it talks about the um, the servant girl washing the sheets, which are musky with the blended odours of oil, honey, blood, semen and sweat. It's a really powerful um, scene. It feels like they've, they've really lived and had an experience. Um, whereas all the religious characters, a lot of where they come unstuck is in sexual issues. Mm. All these other people are like using their faith in a way, you know, to sort of suppress their emotions and their ideas. And at least Palinor you sort of feel goes with it and yeah. tend to do it's with. the absence of guilt i mean what she yeah. describes yes. there is the absence of guilt and what she's dealing with is a largely well a specifically catholic yeah. um yes. kind of era and and people yes. whose kind of belief it absolutely ties them in knots and he can just do what he wants and i suppose it's a generous offering i mean i was kind of mm. saying two minds about it. i couldn't work out whether it was an act of, of quite it, it was quite bizarre slightly aggressive in a way well, yeah. why do we think that more i i didn't feel that at all it seemed to me that in a sense in saying that you you you, you show that in a sense you're caught, trapped in the in the world of moral uh, uh, I am, I'm the Catholic. moral system yeah. you know uh, in yeah. a sense uh, and what Palinor says, uh, and it's a description of what uh, atheism might offer to people, is that he accepts the world as it is. Mm. Uh, and uh, presumably, your, it's a demonstration that among the things he accepts are the pleasures of the world, however they come. And, and his intent is to give pleasure and receive pleasure. I would, yeah, I would agree with that, except that he takes a girl. I mean, he, he has no... He, he just simply wants to have sex. He thinks of his wife, and then the next thing is a woman yes. comes into the room mm -hmm. and he goes, she is something that I can have sex with. Yeah, I mean, it, and it is the one thing that makes you question. Oh, but, yeah, but, the, but then, my dear, you, you're really basing it on a notion that there is some kind of hard and fixed morality which says you may not do that because, in fact, this is an immoral thing. And the whole question of whether that's an immoral thing, whether it's absolutely immoral to, 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 to have a wife and also to, to give no, pleasure to no, another... No, not that. Mm -hmm. No, that wasn't, what, that wasn't what I was thinking. It was because of the woman coming into the room, because she had, at that point, no feelings for him. And, and because we're not, we weren't told how she felt about him initially, and she was afraid. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was what was problematic for me. Well, just two yeah. things on that. Before. I mean... Uh, I, I agree with you, but he does use honey, which yes, seems to be nice. Yes, he does use honey. <laughs> and also, um, if being an atheist can mean that you get into sort of a three-way sex triangle, and, you know, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, it's not something mm. I've ever had I'm to sure that's what the book, says, uh, the book says it's not a bad thing, and it says it so gently and innocently and sweetly, and I don't think there is much menace in it at all. Mm. I think it's, a, it's an, it meant to be, anyway, a description of somebody who, of course, he accepts the world, can accept the variety of its pleasure, and, and that's part of perhaps of the argument. Anyway, you can see it's a book that not only gave us all great pleasure for the story it tells, but leaves you thinking about all sorts of things, doesn't it? We've been talking about Knowledge of Angels by Jill Payton Walsh, and it brings me to my choice. Well, my choice is uh, The Good Soldier by F. Ford Maddox Ford. It's a novel that was first published in 1915. It's, it's a tale of passion. That, in fact, is the subtitle, A Tale of Passion. And it's told by an American. He's a, a Quaker from from, I think, Philadelphia. And it begins with the first meeting at a, at a sort of bathing place, a spa in Germany, uh, between him and his wife, uh, Florence, and an English gentleman, Edward Ashburnham, and his wife, Leonora. Uh, and the first words of the book are uh, memorable to me. I've read the book four times, and I always come across those opening words with a sense of surprise. Uh, this is the saddest story I've ever heard. Uh, and I have to say at once that, that one of the beauties of the novel for me is, uh, I think... 
almost what's most fascinating about it is the way it's told. For the narrator, it's the story is more than he can quite hold in his head. And he lets the story out, so to speak, bit by bit. Sometimes he gets the bits out of order. And he worries about getting it right. Uh, he despairs about getting it right. Uh, and, you know, as anyone might, trying to, to, to make a tale out of any great uh, tangle that, that, that life would lead us into. And, and this is a tangle. It is a tangle. Briefly, I mean, the story is, here's a, the good soldier is Edward Ashburnham, this gentleman, and that's what he really is. I mean, he's a thoroughly good professional soldier, and, and he's, in the classic sense, a, a, an English gentleman. Uh, and as the tangle of the story spreads and spreads and spreads, uh, you find that at the heart of this uh, gentleman lies a sort of uh, helpless destructiveness. When it comes to women who draw him, Whoever they may be, he's, he's ruthless. And everyone in the story, the narrator, the wives, all the women in the story, except a, a gorgeously impervious Spaniard, uh, they all, everyone steadily coarsens. Well, I've read the novel, as I say, three or four times, and I'm still startled by the twists and turns of it. I, I'm still startled, for example, when the narrator, who was talking about a moment when um, Edward Ashburnham doesn't, uh, by some chance, go to South Africa for the Boer War, when he says... Uh, Edward ought, I suppose, to have gone to the Transvaal. It would have done him a great deal of good to get killed. Well, when, what did you think? Well, I mean, it, it's interesting that you talk about the whole style of it, because initially the skittishness of it I found very difficult. I kept yeah, thinking, right. have I missed something? Yeah. And I kept turning back the pages going, did, well, do I know this information? It, uh, but once it was, this, it was this kind of, this need to tell, that was so, I thought in the end it was so brilliantly done, yeah. that, that he just kept going... Oh, oh, I've said that. I, again, I kept being annoyed throughout the book at, at moments going, just get on with it, just tell the story, because that was really where it was most riveting rather than in the kind of the diversions, I thought. Um, but it was, I mean, it, it, as the book went along, I, I, thought it was, uh, I thought it was extraordinary. I thought it was extraordinarily inexplicitly explicit for the time. Yeah, I think that's a good phrase. Um, and it reminded me overwhelmingly of The Great Gatsby. Um, and, the, and this narrator is a character of, of Nick in The Great Gatsby. It's a man who's sort of standing on the sidelines emasculated by his experiences, unable to participate. Mm. And, I, and I, as a device, I find that very uh, very appealing, about, you know, as, as it is in the game. And quite the difficult to do to have a, a narrator like this who is, in fact, saying, I'm a wimp, and to, use, yeah. to use an unsuitable term yeah. for a book of 1915. But that's yeah. what he's saying, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Stuart? Um, well, I, I came to it with a prejudice. I l looked at the uh, name Ford Maddox Ford of a man who has the same word at the beginning and the end of his name. <laughs> and uh, and the, of the sort of... Um, oil painting on the front of people in a parlour taking tea and I thought oh god and when I was like 50 pages in and still like nothing had really happened I thought I'm not going to enjoy this and then it suddenly it just catches up on you the way that the story's being told it does it does it is skittish it does dance around that is confusing in a way but then that's part of what, what's good about novels they don't have to be linear like films they can mm -hmm. follow the way the man recollects the story and the, the uh, narrative follows his discoveries and uh, his fears and his, his uh, implicit guilt in the whole situation rather than the actual line of events. But I did really like it. And also it, it seemed to be about people, people being torn between, not dissimilarly to Knowledge of Angels in a way, people being torn between behaving in a way that they'd been trained to uh, historically and socially and religiously and trying to make practical considerations mm. about the, um, the way that, that they would behave for their uh, maximum happiness. There was a bit at the end when they, they make an arrangement for uh, one of Edward's mistresses to go away, and it's all done very, very politely. And the narrator describes the scene and says, I think it would have been better in the eyes of God if they'd all attempted to gouge each other's eyes out with carving knives, yeah. but they were, open inverted commas, good people, close mm -hmm. inverted commas. And that seems to be the crux of the whole thing, really, that he, he wants the people to... It would be better for people to live and follow their instincts than to, yeah. than to be... Um, suppressed by these sort of social laws. Yeah, yeah. it's it's funny she said. I was I was I did find parallels between that mm, and, yes. and the knowledge of angels, and I thought it was very interesting. It says on the on the fly, I think that Graham Greene loved the book. Yes, yes. And I thought, as a, a you know, as a man who had such kind of a, such a problematic attitude towards his own Catholicism and faith, yes. that it was a really interesting book for him to yeah. to have liked. And, it, and I mean, it is it is like can faith overcome, can love conquer all. It's and, yeah. and in this it just can't, and that's what's sort of yeah. so riveting about it. It's so and cool. at the end, the narrator does say, perhaps Leonora was right. Perhaps Roman Catholics with their queer shifty ways are always right. They are dealing with the queer shifty thing that is human nature. Well, that was that was another thing that was obviously fascinating to me, being, you know, brought up Catholic, mm. was 
was this was this prejudice, mm. this really strong prejudice, and his misogyny towards Leonora comes out through his prejudice about her Catholicism. Yeah. I thought, yeah. and and I found that I found that extraordinary that that was clearly a, a, an, an openly held view mm. of Irish Catholics at that time. I mean, we do seem to be talking about the same thing in discussing both books. Mm. In a way, what you see here, I, I mean, I think Stuart put his finger on it when he said that in a sense it's about people who are who are not able to behave in any sense naturally yeah. because they have set this enormous smothering uh, cap of uh, ideas and, and bring upbringings and so on and they can't better if they gouge their eyes out to it yeah, part of that that actual sentence was one of the sentences where it started to, s to slip a bit for me the narrative voice because throughout the whole throughout the whole novel you feel you're um you're reading the words of an amiably slightly confused man trying to make the best of the situation and understand it yeah. but then when he starts to put things like good people in inverted commas yeah it, it, you feel like the author's voice is coming through and yeah. putting a kind of gloss on what he's saying. That is a, a bit of a shame, because up until the sort of closing 20 pages, really, it had been completely perfect, and it seems as if uh, Ford, Maddox Ford, can't quite, he doesn't quite trust us to take away the message he wants us to. He has to kind of point oh, it up a bit. Did you feel that? I, what I felt about that end was that, in fact, all the things that have been simmering underneath this Quakerish surface mm. are beginning to come out there. Actually, at that point, the narrator does become rather vicious himself, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing I've just quoted to you about, about, the, about the Roman Catholics is, is a fierce thing, isn't it, compared yeah. with what he's been saying, because he's had this sort of uh, self-consciously mild voice throughout, is not he? But his anger, that's what I think is interesting. I mean, yeah. I don't know how personal an experience this is. It strikes me as an incredibly personal experience. I know that's a terrible mistake to, to no, make when reading, when reading a book. There's a, but, of, there's a lot of autobiography in it. But his anger is, is, is really acute at times, mm. and, and I think it's, you know, when he puts on the authorial voice, it's, it's a kind of an, an attempt to legitimize that sometimes mm. um i quite like the very ending of the book because it because it is very open-ended and very factual yeah um and there isn't a kind of a, yeah. a final word on it from him um one of the things that really interested me about this was his his extraordinary kind of insight into the into specifically leonora into a woman's feelings at being Again, it's kind of confused with it, with her being a Catholic in this terms of her trying to preserve her husband. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The, the, the the wronged wife, the woman mm. who's been cheated on again mm. and again and again. Mm. In terms of her her decision to keep her man at all costs, mm. basically, yeah. um, and and he sees that you know clearly, I think is a wrong decision. Yeah. You know that they should have just sort of all let each other yeah. go. But I think that was that sort of really really amazed me. The sort of his his yeah. understanding of that kind of obsession and and the sort of jealousy yeah. sublimated jealousy and on the other hand what, what was contradictory with that was his was his you know misogyny as well mm. that in the end in the end edward ashburnham is a good soldier and the women just messed it up yeah but there's such a lot boiling underneath because it's also possible to deduce from various indications especially towards the end that uh, that, that the narrator loves edward Mash ashburnham oh yeah yeah well that's this is that's a powerful feeling isn't complex it complex about it you know yeah. the man is 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 stupid and weak and and unappealing, but he's a good soldier. Yes, I didn't find him attractive at all. Actually, I really wanted to give him a slap, you know, and say, look, <laughs> just either discuss things or yeah. you know, don't sneak about in the shadows all the time. I, I mean, I, I think he he didn't seem to take responsibility for his own actions, yeah. and uh, I found him really really frustrating. I much preferred I much preferred everyone else yeah. in it. Well, I suppose if one were writing an essay on the English gentleman, one of the things you'd have to say is that one being made an English gentleman of that sort did make you incapable of responsibility, and so his wife, mm. in fact, does all his work for yeah. him, mm -hmm. and is furious because. Part of his being a gentleman is he doesn't know how to thank her for doing it. Yeah. He doesn't know how to do that. Anyway, again, I mean, it's just like the first one we were talking about. It, you can see a, a, a fascinating story, a tremendously fascinating story, but a book that leaves you with all sorts of unfinished thoughts going on, really, uh, and, and curiously linked with the first one. Well, see if it's curiously linked with the third one. Uh, Morena, your choice. Well, my choice is um, The Wasp Factory by Ian Banks. Um, and the novel was first published in about 1984, and I think I probably read it soon afterwards, and it really had a tremendous impact on me. It's basically the story of a 16-year-old boy, Frank Coldhaim, who lives on a remote Scottish island with his sort of ex-hippie father. And the story opens as his older brother, Eric, escapes from a mental institution and starts to make his way back to the island and back to the house. And as bit by bit as he makes his way back, we hear the story of Frank's life and of the strange life that it is. He has these bizarre rituals. Um, we find out that he's actually a child murderer. And all of these things are revealed to us. And there's a huge final revelation when Eric actually arrives at the house. The book takes on themes, I think, of good and evil, nature and sexuality, madness and sanity, in a, in a style that is 
disturbing, but also really funny. It was Ian Banks' first novel, and I find that quite hard to believe, really, um, because it's incredibly skillful. Uh, the way that he takes us through this bizarre, obsessive life of this young murderer, and it's just utterly compelling. Um, I don't know, as a reader, I had this sort of twisted joy identifying with this with this strange character, Frank Coldhame, mm -hmm. um, and then enormous relief that it wasn't actually me. It's sort of, you feel pulled back from the brink of being this person. And I think it's also, another thing that really appealed to me was the fact that um, it's it's set in such a remote community, and and I think that had, had appealed to me as I was sort of brought up in a remote community, and I think that would also appeal to anybody else from a similar environment. I'm not usually a fan of descriptive writing in terms of, you know, places. Um, but in the Wasp Factory, it's really important the way that the way that the, the island is described. And this young man's attitude to the island is, is it's like, um, I thought of it as being rather like a baby's attitude to its mother. You know, he's really protected by it, needs it, um, and feels like king of it and afraid of it all at the same time. The protagonist is strangely um, lacks compassion or love for anyone apart from his mad, lunatic, dog-burning brother. And that makes him very endearing in a strange way. For me, it was an unforgettable book, and it was also the first book I'd ever read that actually smelled like childhood. Ah, that's a strong thing. Um, Stuart, what did you think? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree up to it. Was, it was nice reading it again. I didn't enjoy it as much this time. I think... Mm. I think partly because what I liked a lot about it as a teenager was its power to shock, and I think the the limits in of like what is shocking in literature have moved such a lot, even in just twelve years. If you look at something like American Psycho, there are things in that that, yeah. that which I think is a great book. But there are things in that that make mm. the Wasp Factory just seem like you know like a children's book really. But you, I think what you said about childhood is really good. All the uh, the way he ritualizes his existence and has little systems for things and it reminded me of something reading it again that i used to do as a kid that i'd forgotten about he, when he's running along around the island if he touches mm. a fence with one with his mm. right hand five minutes later he has to make sure that he touches mm. with the left hand i remember doing things like that and feeling that i was sort of personally responsible for like the balance of the universe in some Absolutely, way and i think that's yeah. a, a thing that kids do in, in fact reading it again i, I feel that it, it really rests on a trick in a sense, I mm. don't believe that the, the narrator whose voice we hear is not really the person who committed those murders. Because I believe that w uh, someone who did that would have a different voice. In fact, the voice here is that of a very liberal person. And a very, I mean, there's that, that feeling for animals, for example. Here's someone who actually has murdered animals, I mean, on a large scale. And he talks about generations of sheep. We made them, we molded them from the wild, smart survivors that were their ancestors so that they would become docile, frightened, stupid, tasty wool producers. The same principle applies to chickens and cows, and almost anything we've been able to get our greedy, hungry hands on for long enough. And that is such a liberal view of animals that you, I don't know quite how to square it with the notion that he is the murderer, the, the killer, the, the sadistic destroyer of animals, among other things. Well, I think that's the point. I think that's the point of the book, is that, is that it is, this is a rational, intelligent, person yes. and this is the person who commits the murders and I think it's the, it's the same with American Psycho mm. I, funny that you should bring that up because I really thought of that when I read this again because in, in the interim I've read that in American Psycho you feel like he he goes to restaurants and buys his suits and mm. listens to his Genesis albums which are all terrible mundane things yeah. as a way of like um, normalising yeah normalising yeah. himself Where and there's nothing he says that is of any value in the whole book the, the actual the, the main character whereas in The Wasp Factory um, Frank does, you know, he does have lots of really good things to say. He, he is, he is sane and rational and likable. Yes, yeah. he has a very rational uh, and it seems to me very sort of sympathetic and gentle, actually essentially gentle philosophy. And I can't, I must say, it, for all the examples you give, quite square that with the person who um, cold-bloodedly murders three well, children. Well, again, you see, I think I think this is to do with the connection to childhood. Mm. I think some people feel very connected to their childhood, some people don't mm. feel very connected. I, I can probably remember more about my childhood and the way I felt about things than I could about how I did mm. two years ago. And so I feel very connected to that sense of, of darkness and that sense of, 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 of knowing what the limits of the world are but wondering where where they, they begin for you, what you could get away with. But this child has got nothing to stop him. Yeah. yeah. But are you saying, in a sense, that in some ways, it's kind it of it's, it's a notion of what might happen rather than what did happen? I can see that in that sense. That in fact, it might be you might be presented with a character who uh, actually is seen as living out all those contradictory feelings that children have: the gentle feelings and the fierce feelings side by side, the destructive and the constructive feeling. It must be said, bringing it back, relating it back to the title of this program, really, it is a good read, there's yeah, no doubt about yeah. that. It's a totally compelling read, it's totally satisfying, and uh, 
I'm surprised by some of those people who are actually repelled by it. It doesn't seem to me a fundamentally repellent book. No, reading, it, reading the kind of the quotes on the jacket was astonishing. Actually, I've got, I've got a copy from 1984, yes. and it has different sort of uh, quotes yes. on it. And people absolutely, so people saying, "Don't read this book. Yes. It's, yes. it's a hideous kind of crime." Yeah, I always think that sort of tends to happen whenever. Um, a lot of uh, older or moved remo or more removed critics come into contact with any aspect of popular culture, though. Yeah. They come well, to like, be just like, uh, yeah. as a amazed by yeah. what's going on. As a tremendously old critic, I... Uh, <laughs> I'm not you. Yeah, well, right. that's very kind of you. But uh, no, no, I, I didn't find that. And I, I am uh, su surprised that people took it like that. Because fundamentally, like the others, it's a philosophical novel, I think. Well, it's about, yes, it's nature it's and nurture. About, yeah, nature and nurture, I think. Yes, of course. Well, we've been talking about The Wasp Factory by Ian Banks. And now I'll remind you of the books we've been discussing. First, there was uh, Knowledge of Angels by Jill Payton Walsh, published by Black Swan at £5.99. Then, my choice, The Good Soldier by Ford Maddox Ford. Sorry, that uh, name offended Stuart. <laughs> lucky for Shakespeare, wasn't called Shakespeare, William Shakespeare. That's right, it's been ridiculous. <laughs> published by Penguin 20th Century Classics at £6.99. And finally, Morwenna's choice, The Wasp Factory by Ian Banks, published by Abacus at £6.99. And so from Morwenna Banks, Stuart Lee and me, goodbye.